I'm Mark Kennedy, the director of George Washington's Graduate School of Political Management. Very pleased to be with you here today. Welcome to our annual Society of Presidential Posters discussion of how opinion impacts the White House and the presidential decision making. I want to have a special guest to those who are prospective students here today. If you haven't met Jonathan, stand up Jonathan, please wave your hand. Uh, please stop by and see Jonathan afterwards. He would love to uh, chat with you. Uh, as you know, GSPM, as we affectionately refer to call our school, is the first and foremost school of politics. And we aim to teach our students the tools and principles and values they need to be effective in participatory democracy. One of those key tools is polling. How do you use it? If you're really going to be an effective politician, you need to understand the intricacies of polling. And after all, policy ideas are just that unless they get the politics right. So it's important to understand that politics. Our esteemed panelists are gathered here today to figure out the many ways that the chief executive in the White House and his advisors, his or her advisors, use polling, whether it be for decision making, for figuring out how to communicate things as an early warning mechanism to figure out what may, might be coming down the road, and to look at trends. First, before we get going, I want to express our gratitude to Mark Penn, who's really the father of this society, and had the idea of starting a series of events focused on public opinion and presidents. He's generously underwritten this society, which includes tonight's activities, but we're also very pleased that Mark Penn has agreed to donate his polling archive to George Washington University, and that will include the six years of data sets poll questions, results, and agendas that he delivered to President Clinton for his six years in the White House. And when they come out in 20 years or are publicly available, I'm confident that there'll be a whole series of reviews written about how that impacted the decisions at that day. And that's exactly what we're considering here today. So let's first of all give a round of applause to Mark Penn for hosting us here today. On to our panelists, Mark Penn, of course, the first one is currently Corporate Vice President and of Strategy and Special Projects for Microsoft. He served as President Bill Clinton's pollsters for six years, starting in 1994, becoming one of his most trusted advisors in his inner circle. His invention and use of the neural personality poll helped identify a new voter in the 1996 presidential campaign, the soccer mom. Penn's insistence on focusing on and targeting initiatives towards this new category of voters has been cited as one of the, new, as one of the key reasons for President Clinton's successful re-election campaign. After leaving the White House, he went on to serve as the head of the international public relations firm Burson Marsteller and president of Penn, Schoen, and Berland Associates. Our second panelist, Barry Jackson, Barry Jackson served as senior advisor for President George W. Bush from 2001 to 2007. He also served at the highest levels at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, serving as the chief of staff for John Boehner. He is uh, considered one of the elite in Washington and has been at the inside of just about every decision that's happened in Washington in the last decade or two. He represents the consumer of polls within the White House. He currently serves as strategic advisor at Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, Shrek, and a managing director of the Lindsay Group. Stan Greenberg, CEO of the polling and consulting firm Greenberg, Quinlan, and Rosen, Rosner, has served as a pollster and strategist for the presidential campaigns of Bill Clinton, Al Gore, and John Kerry. His early work focused on Reagan Democrats, a key constituency in the Democratic successes of the early 1990s. He's advised campaigns around the world. He is an accomplished author, penning the New York Times bestseller, It's the Middle Class, Stupid, with his Democracy Corps partner, James Carville. Prior to entering politics, Stan taught at Yale University. And our moderator is John Dickerson, a lifelong Washingtonian. There are not many of those in this world. Currently serves as political director for CBS News and chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine. Prior to his time at Slate and CBS, he covered the White House for four years for Time Magazine. Journalism is deep in his blood. His mother, Nancy, the subject of his book, On Her Trail, was CBS's, CBS News' first female correspondent. The Washington Post once called his questioning style 
cleverly worded, seemingly harmless, but incisive. So good luck, guys. And I'll turn it over to John Dickerson. Thank you uh, so much, Mark, and thanks all of you for coming. This is, uh, for me, a, a, such a delight for, for two reasons. When you're in the press, you talk a lot about the polls. You all, since you're interested observers, read a lot about the polls. You hear about the polls. It may be one of the things in politics that uh, the relationship between the amount that's talked about it and the amount that's actually known about it is vast. And so we have here people who actually know about polls and who've used them, with two pollsters who know how to make them, how to ask the questions, how to read them to get answers that are effective and useful. And then we have a consumer of polls uh, in Barry Jackson who's been on the inside taking this uh, data and using it to uh, try to make public policy. And the other reason I'm excited is not only to get the inside scoop of how these are used, how polls are used in an effective way, but we are actually at a time in Washington where things are happening. Instead of the kind of clotted period of the last two years where we've kind of swerved from one budget fight to another, we're having real debates about uh, the budget in a way that's a little bit more sensible than we've had in the past, and about the priorities for the nation, about gun control, and about immigration. Two huge topics with uh, lots of different cross-cutting constituencies. And the future of the parties are tied, it, it, many people think, to, uh, to those issues. So I'm gonna throw open it very, in a very general way, first starting with Mark and Stan, and then uh, Barry, you can clean up on this question. But Mark, how are polls used inside an administration? How should they be used? Just start us off with that. <clears throat> um, well, I, I think that uh, uh, how should polls be used in the administration start, always starts with a discussion how they shouldn't be used, right? Which, because everyone would always come up, and I'm sure, you know, Stan has had the same thing. Well, so, you know, does the president, and by the way, I was joking with Stan, I said, Stan, Stan and I, you know, uh, uh, Stan and I both serve different presidents. They just happen to have the same name uh, over the years. So, uh, mm -hmm. but as you'll see, as you'll see very much, people always say, well, do the president, you take a poll, and then the president just does whatever policy polls best. And that's just, that's just not how polls either are used, should be used, uh, really, polls are part of a complex decision making of the President of the United States. And, and I always say, if you think in your mind that the President, to make a decision on something, has to consult uh, probably four to five basic desks, desks, what I call the congressional desk, right? How are you going to get this thing through Congress? What are your people telling you about the chance that we can get this thing actually, actually passed and through if it requires Congress? Then there's the policy desk, right? What are the policy guys and women telling us that whether or not this thing makes any sense, right? So if we're gonna come out with a policy, is it gonna actually reduce uh, mileage or gasoline use? You know, half the policies that we actually do come out with don't actually do their intended effects. So the policy desk has to actually tell, give you something that's worth fighting for, right? <clears throat> then you're gonna have the special interest desk. You know, even though public opinion may be one way or the other, there may be intense groups that have really organized around an issue, and trust me, they are going to show up when you say something, even one word in the State of the Union about it, right? And then you're going to have the press desk, right? The people may be one thing, but the Beltway Press, you know, thinks, thinks quite another. And then finally, you have the public opinion desk, right? And so in order for the president to kind of successfully I think get, make a policy decision, move it forward, he really has to consult all of those desks, all of those desks successfully. And if you leave out any one of them, chances are you're going to fail. Sometimes you have to override one of those. Sometimes you're going to get strong congressional opposition or special interest group. You know, you may have to overcome NRA opposition or the opposite. or or something like that, but you're gonna know that in advance and you're gonna leverage one desk or the other. But that's kind of the model that I was worked on. And so the short answer to your question is, polls and public opinion are best used as just one spoke in the wheel of presidential decision making, properly done, without which the president runs blind. And if he runs blind, he runs quickly into a wall that he doesn't even see. And that's why it's so important that these polls be taken and the president understand in the context how he can win his policy decisions, you know, in what is an extremely complex environment. Stan, pick up on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
<clears throat> I think we're in the same. Uh, I think we're in the same place, uh, but coming at it uh, from dif different aspects of that uh, of that same process of getting to a successful presidency um, and successful actions on a whole range of initiatives, um, uh, and successful in trying to take the country in different uh, places. When you think about the the White House, the idea that public opinion, that the voters, that polls. Uh, would have too much influence is so preposterous. This is a city dominated by special interests, by money, by media, by so many range, so many range of legitimate interests. When I think about, if I think about a, a decision taking place, you know, in the uh, in the White House and who weighs in on that in that process, the ordinary voter, it is like such a small piece of it. Now it's critical that the president, you know, move in an effective way with the voters, um, educate the voters, engage the voters, and ultimately be held accountable uh, by the voters. Um, but it is a, it is they are ordinary people are, you know, are almost swamped in this process. And I think all of us who have been in this role, um, when I before I took this role, I met with Dick Worthlin to talk through how he did this role with uh, with Ronald Reagan, and he would, he told me that he would get 15 minutes. You know, each, each week, uh, which he was uh, just him and the president, and he would protect that you know t uh, time um, to try to keep the president in touch with in the midst of all that, and and I tried to do the the, uh, the same thing with uh, President Clinton, and we were in different we were in uh, you know we were in different periods of the book of the Bill Clinton. Um, presidency. So I was involved in the first, uh, the, the, the first election and the very difficult, disastrous first couple, two, three years, and um, uh, encompassing the disastrous 94 uh, elections, disastrous from a Democratic uh, mm -hmm. side. Um, and Mark was involved in the re-election re um, and the uh, closing out of the uh, Clinton term. So very different, uh, different uh, uh, roles. So in a very quiet second term. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so getting Getting ordinary voters heard, you know, you know, giving them the postcards that people fill out in focus groups, and letting them read it unfiltered, and what people, you know, are thinking. The other piece of it, though, is like bigger than than this, uh, and it, it it may be polling, it may be the pollster, it depends very much on the nature of the campaign that brought people to the uh, to the presidency, because the pollster uh, is normally um, the kind of the holder of the project, the political project. That you know that either changed the party or you know or um, uh, created the campaign um, that brought the president brought that candidate to the uh, to the presidency, and they own they kind of own the project uh, going in. That's not always the pollster. Probably Axelrod is probably more in that role. If I think of President Obama, he's probably more in that you know in that uh, role. I think the both of us played the, very much played that role that we were the ones who understood the project and the president trusted us. To understood the project it was a very different project at the points that we came to it, and they wanted us in the room so that you know we would, could remind people when people were talking about deficit reduction, you know that there was you know we didn't run on deficit reduction. Bill Clinton barely ever mentioned the deficit as one of the goals that he wanted to uh, you know achieve. He ran on a people first agenda, and remembering that investment was critical. So you're kind of the owner of the project, and then. Lastly, I'll say so we can have discussion, more discussion on this, um, is narrative, the story. The, uh, you know, the, in, in my case, and I think probably in Mark's case as well, that there, if you're going to be successful, there, you know, there is a process of public engagement, public education that involves the story and narrative that you have to build in the presidency um, that was, you know, Central to the early years of the, of, of the Clinton presidency, central to his real uh, after he was, uh, you know, reelected. Um, I think one of the challenges for the Obama administration was the failure to tell uh, a story um, on whether it was the economy or the health care plan or the whole range of things. Uh, and, I, and what I'm most impressed with on the whole gun issue and 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 gun violence issue is how much the president engaged on that, that issue, brought people you know, into it, went to the country, stayed on it again and again and, and, uh, and again. Um, he may not have won the vote um, you know, in the Congress, in the Senate, um, but my guess is we'll, when we look back on this, he will brought the country, and this will impact us in some way. I don't know how it will play out, um, but it's, a, it's an effective role for the president. I want to get back to the, uh, the power of the narrative, but Barry, I want to get from you uh, you sat at some of those desks, some of the best desks inside of a White House. Um, 
to talk to it about it from your from your perspective inside, and also it will, from the House side, if you want to as well, from mm -hmm. your position there. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I'd, I'd say is that um, I'm probably closer to Mark's view on this than Stan's about the role of polling for a president, and that it is it's one tool in a set. The, the, in the Bush White House, um, how polls were used was set during the 2000 campaign. And when <clears throat> then Governor Bush was in a room like this with prospective donors or supporters or whatever, part of his standard stump was, I understand I'm running for the second most powerful job in Washington. <laughs> and then he would say, the first most powerful is the presidential pollster. And he's referencing, I missed that. it probably <laughs> irritated you to no end, but he was referencing this Time Magazine cover with Dick Morris on President Clinton's shoulder as if pres every move that the president made was because Dick was interpreting the polls and telling him what to do. Um, so when we came into the White House, there was a really clear sense that decisions are made first and then polling is used as a tool to help the president with whatever the decision was that he made. Um, we obviously, if you look at a lot of the topics that the president took on, um, if, if he had been driven by polling, he wouldn't have done them. You know, if you talk about Social Security reform, or you talk about the surge in Iraq, or you talk about immigration in 07, or even the Medicare, um, or No Child Left Behind, um, and you can argue if he had used <coughs> polling up front, would he have been more successful or not? But the culture in our White House was he had a vision, he knew what he wanted to get accomplished, and then all of us that had the privilege of working for him, it was what are the tools we can do to help him implement? Right. But, but let's, mm -hmm. just sticking with Social Security mm -hmm. for a moment, I mean, you could argue that was either a public problem or that he didn't get the support from his Republican in, but Republicans in Congress who didn't want to run uh, behind yeah. that either. So you could argue you never got, you didn't have to look at the polls, your problem was with your own side. But, but that choice of priorities, your argument seems to be that priorities were set by the president and then you used the polls to shape the way to sell those priorities. But wasn't that a huge time suck, the Social Security adventure, and couldn't perhaps if he'd taken a poll where he was a little more in line with what the public could withstand, he might have been able to do, been more effective on other things. Well, uh, on Social Security, I, I, I point out that in the first campaign, that was part of the platform that he took to the country. You know, these are the, if, if you honor me with the office, here are the things that I'm going to attempt to do. I'm going to attempt to do a drug benefit. I'm going to attempt to reform Social Security. I'm going to attempt to do education. I'm going to attempt to bring faith back into the public square. I'm going to strengthen the military. I mean, we knew what those things were. The argument, a very legitimate, can be made that just because he ran on them in the first <coughs> term didn't mean the mandate, you know, favorite Washington word, extends into the second term. I think a lot of people would say, you know, we did not campaign on that it, um, against Senator Kerry. And so when we came rolling out of the gate, it was kind of like, whoa, whoa, what are you guys up to? Right. <laughs> <clears throat> this, is, this, this point on Social Security is critical uh, because I want to go back to the point I was making about the role of polling. Uh, and I was, going, I was speaking quickly, so I was uh, leaving the impression that polling was det maybe determining the choice of project. We were elected on a political project. We changed the Democratic Party. Bill Clinton changed the Democratic Party, ran as a new kind of Democrat. We ran, on, we, you know, unlike the, the kind of things the Republican Party is now thinking of doing, uh, to try to you know, win in the general election. Bill Clinton ran on welfare reform in the Democratic primary. He beat Jesse Jackson in the primary um, uh, using welfare in Georgia. We did, all the candidates were to our left that we defeated. Harkin, Kerry were all running to the left of us when we won the, the primary um, in the 92 election. We ran on trade. We never, I never ever pulled on trade. Trade was part of our identity. He supported NAFTA, he supported you know, free trade. It was part of his identity as a new Democrat that was different than uh, being aligned with the unions um, at that time that allowed him to, to, uh, to run. So that project came with it. So when he was elected, his first priority was the, his economic plan. 
the key piece of the economic plan he accepted at the very beginning was that he was going to reduce the deficit by X amount, far beyond anything he expected to do. It would crowd out all the spending. So everything we had run on um, was overturned by the focus on the deficit, which everybody argued he had to do now. We never, ever polled on the question of whether he should do the deficit or not, and that's the biggest thing. We shifted from deficit to investment. I mean, this was his entire life. I mean, focus on Bill Clinton ran on education, investment. He was the education governor in, in Arkansas. He ran, or the economic plan was, that, you know, was, uh, was education. People First was all about investing in education. All of that got knocked out. There wasn't one penny increase in spending on education for three years uh, because of the budget, um, which was only focused on the deficit. So he made that change without any polling. The only issue was how do we now sell it to the country? And that was, and that, so the polling was centered on how do we make the, the case? And it took a long time to get to a fairly simple argument that we have a, a fair and balanced plan, half spending cuts, half tax increases on the rich. Um, everybody contributes. Mark, where do you come down on this question of priority picking and the roles of polls in, in picking your priorities <clears throat> as a president? Well, you know, I've seen polls play a pretty, you know, a president, I think, as you just said, can lay out a number of priorities. But then the question is, which are you going to do first? Right. When and how? And which is going to be most effective, right? When you run into a healthcare roadblock, that, didn't, that, didn't, that auto accident, in a way, then, then knocks out your next six ideas, right? Because it becomes so, so dominant. You know, take, see, I think that if, frankly, I think the Bush second term could have benefited from a couple of polls, right? They needed to be more on their, their public opinion toes in the second term. And I think second terms, second terms are very tricky. They're, they're often driven by vice presidents who want to run for president. And if you don't have one, then internally there can very quickly be a sense of, well, we got elected. We can do what we want. And what's very powerful about the presidency is the minute you, you know, you think like I got that mandate before, you have to win the mandate every single day to really have the mantle of leadership in this country. And, and in many ways, a lot of the things that happened in the second term were discipline forcing. They meant that the entire White House was focused not on getting done what it wanted to get done and winning the mandate every single day, right? And, and that's a powerful motivating force for everybody. So to go back to your question, you know, polls are helpful. They, they, they should tell you how to help sequence it. Maybe you want to take some of your easy wins first, right? But, <clears throat> you know, when you start out with Social Security, right, as your first thing in, in your second term, and that gets shot down, eh, people look at your second term, you've lame ducked yourself way early. You might have been better off picking three or four items building up some, some momentum, creating a second term coalition, and then taking on something that you knew was gonna be really tough, mm -hmm. that required a lot more preparation. Well, it, can I just, um, it's all very logical what you're saying, Mark. I think the one thing, and this is where only if you're intimately involved, you know, you joked about the second term for President Clinton, you know, we go into 2005 knowing that Iraq is dominant. And you know the president often said, a state of war is an unnatural state for a democracy. And so we were gonna have challenges. And so there was a conscious decision that was made, we're gonna be sailing into really rough waters because the decision that the president was taking on, on Iraq was one that was it didn't matter how much polling you did. It was never going to be popular. It just wasn't. And so coming out of the gate, it was rather than can we do a successive string of small things, it was we have, we have a moment to try to do something big. And this was the big item that was left over from the first term. <clears throat> and so there was a, a reason. Looking back, it may have been wrong, and what you're suggesting may have been the proper way to do it. But it wasn't polls that, it, I mean, it was him. It was his gut, and it was us then saying, all right, where do we go? May I ask you a question briefly about the Bush White House, but it gets to a larger theory that I've heard President Bush used to say it all the time, but also 
uh, Rahm Emanuel had this theory about the, the Obama White House. President Bush, when I, I was on those 66 cities he went to to sell that Social Security plan, mm. is he used to say the harder the mountain, the bigger the climb, the more capital I build going for this big thing. And so that if he accomplished it, or even the act of going after it, would create uh, goodwill, would create uh, capital to go do other things. Is that a correct characterization of his worldview? And then I want to ask Stan and Mark, does it work that way? So, uh, so I would say that, that you know, um, polling was not a big part of our decision making process, but you know, we always looked at them and we always knew. And it was a character issue that I think drove the president to the conclusion you're talking about, John, which is that um, even the people that just were really unsatisfied and may not have liked where we were headed, the one thing they said about him at the end was, you know what? We know where he stands. We know what he's trying to do. May not agree with it. And for him, that was a big part of defining who he was as president and who he was as a leader. Right. So, See, I believe in the, uh, the, pro the political project um, as, as the central piece, or certainly on why people get elected. And, and in this case. Can I just interject? Is, we define the difference between the political project and the narrative, because they feel like they're kind of the same. Well, the political, uh, the, Bill Clinton ran as, I mean, what defined Bill Clinton was someone who, you know, changed his party. I mean, he defined his strong leadership as someone who changed his party. And that was the, that was, you know, that was, that's what gave him strong, that, that showed he could overcome all these special interests, he could govern for the average person, you know, so, you know, the, and the, now, at the heart of that was also the middle class, the forgotten middle class. So he was going to, so that the Democratic Party, again, could, you know, could win those voters and lead on their behalf with, like, the central project. And that then produced a whole range of policies that, unfortunately, deficit, you know, didn't fit the project. And so, what do you do? What do you do now when that's there? But you can't do Social Security unless you make it a project in your election. It's just like too big a piece. And, and I think you used the language reform. I remember it well because I was, you know, the, uh, you know, the, I was very involved in this process. And up to 2000, I was very involved with uh, with uh, with Gore. The you can't do reform as a word that hides what you really intend. He did not run on, cha on changing Social Security in the way he ultimately did, and that produced his broken trust. If you look at his poll numbers, the president's poll numbers, there is no honeymoon in the second term. It, it goes down almost immediately, I think, because he went off on this issue, which he did not lay the foundation for. If you're going to do, it was different in this election. Republicans did lay the foundation for this. Ryan did be, uh, raise, seriously put on the table ways of changing the way we deal with Medicare and Social Security um, you know, going forward. And, and had the basis, people understood, I think, that if he took it up, it was not going to be a surprise that he was going to deal with Medicare and Social Security uh, and reform it. But it was not true for, for, for Bush, which is why he's, uh, he lost so much support so quickly. Mark, yeah, the, no. the, 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 just to, what I was meant about um, President Obama is, is Rahm Emanuel basically said, if, every time you win, you get you build capital, which in his view meant support yeah, with... Win, though. Right, <laughs> true, yeah. <laughs> Although, well, health care, I mean, the president won to the extent that yeah. there's a bill. He was against going, but, uh, but Rahm was against going. Yeah, well, that's, so, that's uh, a separate question. But, <laughs> but it, it, this idea, Mark, that you can build, but do tough things. Your polls may not tell you to put them in the priority list going in, but you do tough things, you build some will, and then that'll change the polls. Well, look, for, for, first of all, it's, it's so interesting actually to talk about the Bush second term, but we'll get back to, we'll get back to it. We don't want to gang up on it. <laughs> the, the, I'm the, used to it. Trust yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the second term, this, uh, well, I should, no, what, what I want to say is, is that there are two critical polling numbers for any president to be looking at. The right track, wrong track of the country, and, and the president's essential approval, right? And, and there's also what I call the rule of 50, which also, I think Bush, the rule of 50 is the minute you fall below 50, everybody piles on you, and before you know it, you're at 38, 35, because it becomes to the political advantage for everyone to whack you. And the minute you're above 50, everybody has to think twice about whacking you, right? And so you can actually build capital up, right? And so, and if you can get in the 60 to 70 range, that's about the practical high of, of how far you can go in, in, you know, in, in, you know, in the country, right? And uh, President Clinton always had higher approval of his policy in the second term. His policies always had higher approval than his personal approval for reasons that are obvious. And then, <clears throat> and you know, I think to stand here, 
he, there were many key elements of the political project having moved back to what was perceived as the center, having endorsed the balanced budget, having created this idea of building the 21st century, you know, having a, a whole series of, I think, economic modernization, you know, moves, probably the original mission, you know, of the second term uh, w was really, was really probably quite, quite different than the first, you know, and by the end, by the middle or the end of the, of the uh, of that term, we were already in a position where there was going to be a huge surplus with budgets balanced. You know, you look, you look upon those days, and it's the last time that the American public, and I'm going to take the first strike, it's the last time the American public had a sustained period of optimism, right? <clears throat> so no president since then, right? So it, it carried over a little bit to the first part of the Bush, then 9-11 happened, and then somewhere, uh, somewhere after 9-11, America turned pessimistic, and it stayed pessimistic through today. Right? And it, it, so this is the first generation of Americans and really the first time both a Democrat, uh, both a Republican and a, president, and a Democrat president <coughs> has faced so many years right, of American pessimism. Normally two or three years, then Americans kind of returns to, well, oh, we've gotten our spunk back, we're going to, you know, that's not what has happened. And I don't know what the cumulative long-term effect on that is going to be on both culture and psyche, but when you hit a decade of pessimism, then that means everybody who turns 21 grew up from age 11 to 21 with a pessimistic outlook, which never happened before. Maybe we can return to that. We're going to turn to these three big issues and how you all would kind of war game those out in a moment. Um, but I want to go to the communications point of this before we make that pivot. And Barry, I want to talk to you. you. You said that polling was used in the context of President Bush figured out what he wanted to do, and then polling was used to kind of shape the message. How were there any times where you felt that was particularly successful? Um, and, and give us a sense of that process. Was it just polling? Was it focus groups? Was it, hey, here's the great word you must keep using? How, how did you use that in the communications no, process? I and it's probably overstated because uh, to my first job at the White House was director of strategy. And we would have This these, was a special new office in the Bush yes, White it House. Was, it was, <clears throat> and, and we were proud of being strategy. We, we took Saturday Night Live serious. Um, <laughs> but it, it, that, that was the place where polling came into the White House, which was, it, it was an opportunity for the senior staff of the president to step away from the West Wing and to just look and talk long term and long range. Rarely did we ever see stuff that says, well, if you'll, if you'll just describe school choice this way, it works. Or um, the, the polling that the RNC did, uh, that, that the White House used, that was not the focus of it. So how is it used to communicate then? So you would, you know, you, you would be able to see uh, groups of, of voters, you know, demographics that were moving one way or the other, mm -hmm. and so were we missing opportunities to speak to certain people that we thought needed to be part of this? You know, every White House has their form of the grid of who are the important constituencies that are in your base and you want to hold them and who are the persuadables and and so you think about the policy that you're advancing how does it fit to right. each of those boxes and and they will they'll have different um, buttons to push for each of them right. so when you so when the president used to talk about social security being for the widows uh, you'd gotten some polling about women in somewhere in there on social security well yeah I, you know we we knew what the policy was going to be, and we knew that you know there was basically, if you looked at it from an age segmentation, there's three cohorts. You, you've 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 got 50 and below, you've got 50 through 62 or 55, which are, you know there's different ways you could cut it, and then there was the seniors, and so you, that's where you ended up with a, if you're currently yeah. on it or you're close. This doesn't impact you. Mark, what, what role should it play in communications? You're in a White House, you're in a meeting. Is it about words or is it about 
themes? Well, we had, uh, it can be both. I mean, I think that, that uh, uh, we all thought, we all thought we had come up with uh, Bridge to the 21st Century. Then uh, two or three years later, I discovered that it was in his uh, earlier convention speech. Uh, none of us had noticed that somehow he had steered us over to it. But we, we picked it's it. It's a bridge to Stan Greenberg. Yeah. <laughs> well, we held, uh, I don't know if you were in those days, but, but it was <laughs> in the speech that, uh, that that Bob, that was funny. It's right in there if you go back. So, the, but we held a weekly meeting. So we held a weekly meeting in the White House with the president and the vice president until he started to, to run for stuff. And in that weekly meeting, and then we had the top communication staff, top political officers, had the economic council. We had everybody, we had, you know, and it kind of grew over time. And it, they started from the campaign strategy meetings, and the president liked them so much, he said, you know what, let's just keep them going. He said, because they make a difference. They're, they're the one interdisciplinary meeting in the White House that we had. And so, so we, every, uh, I would spend the week kind of accumulating information for this meeting, and we'd, we'd look at first at uh, the newspapers, and I'd kind of contrast. Here's what the Beltway's covering. Here's what, you know, USA Today. Here's what the polling is showing, right? Here are some ideas, right, that, of things we might do, right, and stuff we might do, and then open a discussion, and, and then it would frame a discussion around it. So, so, that w so I think you forget there's an interweaving of communications with words, policies, actions, and communications. And all four of those things, I think, I think have to occur together. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you've seen some people kind of separate them. But the truth of the matter is, words and actions are, you know, really have to be thought about as one. Stan, picking up on that, during the Obama administration, there have been a lot of his supporters who have said at various times, you know, if he would just say it this way, he suddenly all opposition would melt and the public <laughs> option would succeed. Or, you know, Give us a sense of, of w where. Look, I, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a choice of words. I do think it's narrative. I do think it's a story. So that if you if you go to his economic plan, the and uh, and you and look and say how how many times did he explain what his economic plan was after it passed? How how many times did he go to the country? Did he explain his plan in the same way that he's done now on dealing on the gun issue? Well, my guess is during that entire period of time of, of the first two years into his presidency, he's probably done about the same amount on the econ economic plan. Forty percent of the economic plan were tax cuts. Two-thirds of every economic proposal he made after the first uh, Recovery Act were tax cuts. How many, what percentage of the American people do you think believe that they got a tax cut? It's 20 percent. Now, if the president at every opportunity said, look, I want you to know my philosophy. This, these are tough times. I want to make sure that we make sure hardworking people are getting a break. So at the core of my economic policy is making sure they have a few more bucks in their pocket, uh, making sure they have tax cuts. And every time he talked about over two, three years, you talk about, because that's your real policy. It's not just narrative. It, it was real policy. It's what he did. So there was no narrative, no story. There was no sense that you were th saying, this is what we're doing now. This, you may not like this level of spending now, but that we're going to move to this, and then after, in the next phase, we're going to move to that. There was no so telling it, people where it, they were in the process. It may be, and, and you maybe just let it slip, that the people know the difference between a tax cut and a tax credit. No, they very you know, much. We have a, a lot of people that. They are overwhelmingly for tax credits. They are overwhelmingly for payroll taxes. They are very much opposed to tax cuts for the wealthy and corporate tax relief. But the, a tax credit, from a policy standpoint, is giving money to people whose taxes wouldn't cover what a tax cut was. They're not paying taxes. And that's the difference between a tax credit and a tax cut, which may be why the Democrats always talked about them as tax cuts, but the country never thought they were real tax cuts because well, they, they weren't getting them. And, okay. and let me just raise that. <laughs> The, you know, uh, the, the, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors once asked me a question. She said, well, I don't really understand. The labor polls show one thing and the business polls show another. Which should I believe? I, I answered our polls. <laughs> 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 uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the, you know, the thing about taxes is actually it is, so, uh, many of these things, you have to, in one, of the, one of the key things is, and particularly as the presidential pollster and in the position that the, you know, three of us, 
been in in terms of advising here, you know, you have to be right about this, right? So, the, and, and when I say right, uh, I can phrase a question, you know, do you, you know, uh, do you, you know, do you support a tax increases on the wealthy? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, how about a tax increase on Stan? You know, sure, yeah, okay. So, but and and so you have to be careful. But then, if you say, well, do you support raising taxes or cutting spending? Whoa, well, 67% say I'd rather cut spending over raising taxes. So there are many different ways to cut questions, right? And you're not cutting questions; you're actually cutting people's minds because. Then people say, well, that's inconsistent. Wow, people are inconsistent. <laughs> News flash, right? right? And so which of that is actually right? Which is going to play itself out? I favor health care for everybody, or I favor health care for everybody uh, as long as as long as <laughs> you know, as long as it doesn't raise taxes, or I favor health care. What's the boundary by which you know, the statement really holds true, right? Or I would say, I would say most vividly for me, the, you know, we had, we had role played, you know, in polling, and projective polling is highly dangerous, as I always say, look, we spent all this time and effort figuring out how people are gonna vote, and we barely get that right. Then you'll take complex subjects, so the, but the government shut down, we had decided and told the president that if the Republicans shut the government down, they were gonna pay the price, right? And it was on that basis we prepared the campaigns, you know, for what we were going to do if they did that and what the president was, was going to take. And then the Republicans shut the government down and it was really unclear. And the president turned to me, like, are you sure this is going to work? <laughs> and I said, we are sure this is going to work, right? And because we, and we were as sure as we thought polling could be, but we had to be right, you know? And could some, could another pollster or even the other side had actually had polling that they had taken to Speaker Gingrich that suggested that people would support the, the government shutdown? Yes, they could have. Because if you cut the issue slightly differently, don't you think there's a huge amount of government waste and in that in the country would, if you cut the issue slightly differently, you could get a different result. So which is going to be right in the real world? That's at the heart of presidential polling presidential advice and being right in difficult situations. And it, it's just, you know, Stan said this when you asked the question about the word versus the narrative. Um, and you asked me earlier about Congress. Congress is more susceptible to, well, if you just say these three words, it's a silver bullet or it's a silver shield for you. And in the White House, as Mark's saying, you don't get that. <clears throat> right. And and you get all kinds of factors that are going to come into this. And, yeah. and you know, guns right now are a classic example of this. The president's rolling out, and, you know, 80% of America or 90% of America supports background checks, but only you know the last Gallup said only 4% of America thinks that that's a real high priority issue. So. Knowing how to do that balance is part of the decision-making process. Yeah, We're going to pivot to guns in a second, but I've Stan to, has I've a view here. On the, I have to say something on the tax piece, um, because I think the, there's a smoke screen on the tax piece that is part of the overall Washington view of the world that allows the kind of fiscal cliff negotiation decision, which caps the tax cuts at $450,000 <clears> instead of the 250000 that the president ran on. Now, you may there there may be choice of wording on questions. There was absolutely no question that the biggest mandate that Barack Obama had, he said it over, over and over again, multiple polls in terms of what did he say he was going to do, what was his mandate, is that he was going to raise taxes for those over two hundred and fifty thousand and hold it for those below. Okay? That got crowded out by the negotiations on the physical cliffs and all the interests here. The idea that the voters aren't clear is, an, is a lack of respect for the voter and a lack of respect for the electoral process we're part of. I, but, but that assumes the... And that has big consequences. It's the difference between no, 600 it, billion and trillion. It, 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 it assumes mm -hmm. that every person that voted for the president's re-election did so because of the 250 number. And you know that's not true. You know a lot of them voted for it because they didn't see Mitt Romney as a viable mm -hmm. alternative. Yes, 
They may have voted for him because yeah. they thought he was By the was way, the support for the 250 is way beyond his vote. The support for you know cutting you know as for a, raising tax so above two is way a, above his vote. So let's let's do for you know background checks. It doesn't mean that that should be the right policy yeah. or that's mm. where the country actually wants to go. If that's the case, we can just mm. get rid of the republic and just go to you know internet. So if we come out of this the, election where this was the central difference between them, and say, but they didn't really mean it. That they, they didn't really send a message when they reelected the president with that, that much clarity about what he was going to do on budget and tax policy. So let's, we're, we're in the middle now of wargaming what the president should do on spending and, and budget. So we'll do that before we go to, thank you for that segue. Um, yeah, exactly. You did that even better than in rehearsal. Um, so Mark, we, uh, the president comes out of the election. Uh, he's facing this huge fiscal situation. Um, what would you have advised him to do with what Stan's talking about, with he knows he has to come up with a solution to our budgetary impasse. He's just won an election in which this was much discussed. How much running room does he have? What should he have done? Did he do the right thing? Well, you know, uh, winning an election, as you said, it, uh, the mandate lasts, you don't know how long. Look, I think that the, the issue was in the negotiations with the Republicans, the president made a decision to settle the tax issues and separate out the spending issues, right? I think that's less about polling than it is about game theory, right? What he did mm -hmm. was essentially, the Republicans had a number of issues, or, 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 or let me take one step back and give you my view about, you know, to, there's two views about bipart how you achieve bipartisan compromise, right? One view is we take uh, something that we really want you know, let's say it's the public option or, or whatever, and we just water it down. So you get the public option and a bunch of private options, and we just water it down until we get Susan Collins and one other person, right? That's viewed as, like, okay, bipartisanship. Or, you know, the other kind of bipartisanship, which, which I believe in and which I think you saw a lot, and I'm not saying you didn't see it in the first year, but you really saw a lot of, I think, in, in 96 to 2000 is, okay, uh, I'm going to get the public option, but you're going to get malpractice reform. That means I'm going to get something I really want that your people hate, and you're going to get something you really want that my people hate, and that's the only way we're going to, and immigration reform is kind of like that. You're going to get something, everybody's going to get something that, that our, people, our people love and that your people hate, but we're going to put it together into something that by and large everybody then comes out and says that was a good thing. Right, as opposed to the opposite that can happen. You put that together and everybody says, I, everybody hates it. Right, it's dangerous. But that's, you know, so, so that's what, so then you come down to this first negotiation, right, and the Republicans needed to get out of the way. The Bush tax cuts were expiring, right? There had been a tactical error in the way that the Republicans had set everything up. They thought it was great. We'll get reelected because it'll expire and it will help us in the elections. But Maybe it did, right? So the Republicans get here, they're here, but, but it's expiring, so they need to deal with that. So the president basically then works out, you know, with all the political forces, he consults all those desks, Stan would have kept it at 250, it's fine, you know, all these desks go through, and he, and he creates something the Republicans can, <clears throat> can live with and pass on taxes. But he forgot about spending. So now the Republicans pass that. But, the problem is now he's lost his leverage because the Republic has all his leverage was the Republicans was on the taxes because they needed that for their constituencies. So then the sequester comes along and the Republicans are like, he's got nothing to, he has no leverage against us anymore, right? And, and even the Democrats were saying, I thought he was going to do this social security entitlement as part of getting this, those tax increases that my constituents liked so that I could tell them we were voting for the stuff we didn't like just to get the stuff that we do like, right? Because that's also part of bipartisanship. Now all that's been separated out. So that makes it a lot harder to, to actually put this thing together. But Stan, don't they say, what well, they say the White House is, but no, we, we still have leverage because we have balance. In other words, the country still wants a balanced approach. The president wants a balanced approach. The Republicans don't. That's where our leverage is. Is that a, anything to that argument? Again, I, first of all, this is not a kind of polling in real time issue. Okay, this is, it is, in my view, political mandate 
from the election in which he had the space. Everybody ex expected that 250 was the line that he was going to demand. And he said, red line in those negotiations. If people had believed him that it really was a red line of 250, that would have greatly affected everything that happened there. And I think he should have been willing um, to go across the cliff because then you would have had everybody's taxes go up and you would have qu quickly been able to you know, pass a, you know, a tax cut. But the, once, you, once you cross this point, you weren't going to get more revenue. But can I ask this, Stan? If, if the president went and had a mandate, does not the speaker have a mandate? Be he, because he and his team ran exact opposite of that, and they maintained well, let me, uh, let me let me step back a little bit because the I believe that he, that he had to do the 250, but I think he also should have immediately offered a very big, you know, decade long, four trillion dollar deal that involved all the kinds of pieces you're talking about. It may have been part, even part of the, you know, going into the fiscal cliff. Yeah. So just to conclude, so you agree with Mark's point on game yes. theory that he blew the game theory basically that the president. By separating it out, had he, wrote, had he been holding his line there, but at the same okay. time having a a package that include all the things that you hate and love, at the same time he would have had been more believable. Barry, let me ask you a question, which is after this election, we'll take it back to polling here. After this election, um, you can say John Boehner, you know, that they had a mandate too, but there was clearly the view that uh, some things needed to be changed and tweaked, and the de the debt limit strategy was clearly in response to something that they heard from out in the country. Um, if you, what poll questions do you ask coming out of the election to find out where the country's at? So that you, you have some sense of where the caucus needs to be uh, in this new environment. Because clearly there was a decision that it needed to be somewhere new. Eric Cantor decided that it needed to talk about flex time and, and your daily life and other people have other decisions. How does the, <coughs> As the speaker, who's got a lot of people going, you know, what, what questions do you ask to elicit what the new guidance is about the direction? Um, so this is where I, I come to this point of you're not asking for guidance and direction, you know. Um, in the game theory, the speaker knew what the president wanted because he had spent months locked in rooms with the president and his folks and saw, you know, started to set up, okay, here's how we're gonna go forward. You know, these are the things our colleagues ran on. This is, you know, we're gonna be a firewall or whatever people wanted to say, the check and balance, or advancing just our economic theory. Um, Boehner, as speaker, has always been committed to a big deal and, and putting together tax reform, revenues, entitlement reform, domestic spending, and willing to go out on the edge pretty dang far to get it. His sense after the election was, and his hope, was that that's where the president would be. That's not where the president was. And they went through 45 days of feeling each other out again, and that just wasn't where the president was gonna go. Okay, we're gonna do, uh, well, let's and, talk about- That's why I can't tell you what polling questions because it wasn't a polling moment. But, well, but clearly, I mean, we know there were polls coming in saying, we got some things we gotta tweak and fix here. I mean, Eric Cantor's not having those, those things over at, uh, yeah. at AEI <laughs> talking about flex time because he suddenly- <laughs> yeah, but, but, but John, you're talking about the house, which- <laughs> Right, which, which is not run as a monolith, I know. You know Mayor always says, I just, I'm lucky to have them singing out of the same hymnal. Sure, sure, fair enough. But but I mean, but 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 see, clearly, people were taking soundings, and 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 some data was coming back telling them to do some new things. I guess is my uh, is my point. And and the and the speaker is not unaware of those. Yeah, but currents. But again, it, it, the difference between the one end of the avenue and the other end of the avenue. I mean, the, the the president and his team have the luxury, particularly in the first term to be able to get all of everybody on the same hill. Mm -hmm. And when you're up on the hill, you unfortunately, it's lead by consensus. Right. Let me ask, let's, let's go to, we're gonna do guns and immigration, and then I've got some questions here from the audience. Um, Stan, it's hard to, hard to sort of game theory out gun control, it's now happened. So mm -hmm. let's do a little after action report 
uh, but you can then tell us what you would do differently, and Mark, I'll do the same with you. What, uh, you know, I mean, as I was saying before, I actually think he's done on guns what he should have done on a, on a whole range of other issues in the first term, and so I'm impressed with what he's done. I think the politics of it, I think we knew from day one that nothing was going to pass the U.S. Congress on this issue. Nothing, there was no scenario you could look at this Congress and think that it was going to pass anything on, uh, on whether assault weapons um, or background checks. I, I, at, any, at no time did I think the end of this was going to be the Congress. Now, there, there's other changes. We're already, you know, we're seeing changes at state level. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll no doubt be another stage to this. But I think this issue is done as a federal issue now until the off-year elections. Mm -hmm. Mark, they keep saying, the president kept saying, said it thousands of times, 90% of the country wants background checks, as if that was the single salient fact. It, it, what was going on there? It is interesting that, uh, it, it is interesting that if you, let's go back to what you call these, uh, th these lessons learned, like uh, shutting down the government, uh, or using the debt limit as a weapon, learned, or gun safety, wow, what they, the President Clinton got the assault rifle ban, but it was seen in retrospect that the political cost of that was so high, right, that somehow, despite polling that shows the opposite, that is you, you fast forward now uh, 15 years later, and it, it is fascinating to me, it's got to be fascinating, this is one of the biggest examples of where polling, in fact, I know, I, you know, I showed, I showed Gore polling that people wanted gun licensing, he even came out for gun licensing if people really looked uh, carefully. And that he was uh, was happy with that choice, but but it, it mm -hmm. but it's true. But he but he took a kind of brave step because because the public for a long time has reported in the polls that they are for a lot more gun safety legislation, and so it is kind of stunning, particularly with all of the moves on on so many other social issues. Now it's true if you look at the polling that actually. This is the one issue that the polling has moved in the other direction on. More and more polling has moved that they did not, until, until the shooting happened, that they did not want more uh, gun safety measures over time here, because people actually have this kind of feeling, well, uh, it's, that it's a more rough and tumble society that, that maybe, maybe they might want to buy a gun uh, and maybe these, these things won't really be effective uh, in stopping criminals. And they sort of have this doubt about it. Nevertheless, you look at it, and it, whether it's 90 or 85 or 62 or whatever poll you want to choose, there's no question that a clear majority supports this. There's no question that senators like Senator Manchin from even West Virginia were willing to go out on this. And there's no question that whatever happened in 1994, right, remains what people are concerned about. That special interest desk is the desk that gets the focus, and the public opinion desk is not seen as the most important one, and that is the way it is. But there is a shift. Let me, let me, t let me talk about this, because yeah, yeah. I was there in 94, um, and pushing the um, assault weapon ban as part of the crime bill that we passed. And congressional leaders begged us to separate out the assault weapon so there'd be separate votes on the, crime, on the assault weapon from the overall crime bill. Uh, we didn't do it. I think it was, I think it was a mistake. Uh, it was, I understood why the president wanted to stay, you know, with, and it was a presidential decision, wanted to stay with it. We paid a big price in the congressional elections, and which is, I think, had, you know, taken this issue off the table. But when I say that I think the president did the right thing, one, I think it was the right thing. But there's also changes in the country where his taking the position he's taking is aligning himself and the Democratic Party with where the country is and going. And that includes a whole range of developments, the increasing diversity of the country, the increasing secularism of the country, less and less religious attendance, uh, less and less people in married households, less and less, and less and less gun ownership, major drop in gun ownership, concentrated among a smaller number of people, but major drop in gun ownership, increasing role of cosmopol big urban cosmopolitan centers and then playing bigger roles in the, uh, in the, uh, in the country's electoral and worldview. Being for gun safety is a very popular in, in, in suburban areas for the voters that some of the voters I think that, uh, uh, that Mark has talked about. It was our, and, you know, just to go back, yeah. in 96, the first ad we ran was the president's success with the assault rifles ban. 
So just how surprising right. it is right. that that wouldn't even remotely get to the table right. in 2013. Right. So we may have lost, but he aligned, he aligned it. There's a price for this on the Republican side, both in the impasse, because the, I think people will look at this as a metaphor, as a symbol of Republican obstruction in the Congress, and that'll carry over to all kinds of issues. I mean, this past week, when you ask about parties, which parties are in touch or out of touch, yeah. the Republican Party at 70%. Yeah. The view that the Republican Party is out, of, is out yeah. of touch. I think this all reinforces a sense that they're in part of the impasse, they're out of touch with mainstream thinking, and they're uh, out of touch with kind of more open, you know, open-minded tolerance. I'm going to, Barry, I'm going to ask you about immigration in a second, but I want to get to some of these audience questions, which are uh, a little more into the nuts and bol bolts of polling. Um, so, Mark, I'll throw this one to you. When you have two polls of this on the same topic showing very different results, what aspects of the poll itself serve as the tiebreaker, or do both get tossed out of the decision-making process, or do you just make up your own numbers and go with it? <laughs> My poll. Three. Uh, no, I, you know, I, <laughs> no, I think you really have to look very carefully at the words of the question, that every word of a question counts. I mean, you know, to the extent that we are, you know, even if you look for unbalanced questions, like, you know, you know, should we pass more gun safety measures? Well, okay, does that question seem reasonable? Yeah, but it's not a fair question. Do you think the country needs more or less gun safety measures? That's a technically fair question. Every single word, and I used gun safety. Well, whose language did I choose? Yours. Did I use gun yeah. control? <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so look, it could be the sample frame. Right? But most of the questions you look at are not about the two or three points that are the sample frame. Most questions are about really looking at every single word, because every single word does matter. Uh, Stan, a question for you. Yeah. Cell phones. Uh, do you see polling moving only to cell phones? How big is the cell phone issue in the, in the future of polling? Um, monumental, but it also may have saved polling. If you, uh, as I, if I step back and you and you and you asked me four years ago where I thought, you know, four or five years ago where I thought polling was going to go, first of all, I thought there'd be a crisis. You know, I I knew how hard it was to reach people on landlines. You know, we were placing 24 calls at least. You know, to you know, uh, to get to a completed interview. Uh, you know, I, I it's like sausage. I kept my head down and try not to see who we're really interviewing. Um, and I, I just presumed at some point there was going to be a crash. Uh, be, you know, between the uh, what the polling was showing, what was going to happen in the real uh, election, it hasn't happened. Okay. The I mean, polling overall was you know, was not right. Our poll, as you know, on the presidential and the congressional, was right within a um, a, uh, a uh, fraction of a point. The but we use cell phones heavily. I mean, the two big issues are for polling are one understanding the growing diversity of the country and making that part of your overall sampling frame to make sure you truly understand how the country's evolving. And second is understanding what's happening with cell phones. Uh, a majority of Hispanic voters are cell phone only. Um, and the majority of African Americans under you know, 40, 60% uh, are cell phone only. Uh, the, and so if you're not using cell, and who you, when you interview somebody on a cell phone, it is a different interview than someone you interview on a, on a landline and ask them whether they're, you know, have a cell phone have to reach them on a cell phone. We have now moved to 50% cell. So 50% of our calls um, are placed to cell phone sample. Now it's much more expensive. Um, we've you know, reduced our sample size a little bit just to, uh, to adjust for it. Um, but it's actually saved us. I mean, we're, I mean, I always thought that people would not do long interviews you know, on cell phones. And we, you know, I keep checking to see whether the drop-off rates are greater. And they're not. People are willing to do long interviews on cell phones. And so it may well be that it's safe. Barry, talking about immigration, um, we'll do a little bit more uh, nuts and bolts of polling. But um, either reflecting on your experience when you were in the Bush White House and the president tried to go up this, this hill, another tough battle he went after, uh, or in the current conversation, how would you use polling? What role at all if you, would you see in polling in that, uh, uh, either more broadly within the Republican constituency or within Hispanics? Because a lot of people in the Republican Party make claims about what comprehensive immigration reform would do in terms of the Republican future with Hispanic voters. So 
take any little bit of that and give us your well, thoughts. I guess it, it and, I'll, and I'll use 07, is that uh, the policy was put in place and you know, the, the three main components of it and the president's view was you can't do one without the other. So then it was identifying, okay, who we're gonna have the biggest concerns and right and left uh, and the middle because there were, and there still are, just a myriad of different buttons that get pushed with this. And, and I'll give you an example. It wasn't so much polling as it was just listening to people, which is a different way of polling, but. Are you talking about focus groups or are you? But um, some of it was focus groups. It wasn't White House stuff, but it was stuff that we were able to access. Um, but some of it was just talking, just face-to-face -face talking with um, different folks. There was a, the assimilation word was, was so offensive and, and it didn't capture what it was that the president was proposing when it came to English language, understanding American civics, American history. And, and so figuring out that the policy itself was not offensive. The way it was described was, was not clicking either with the Hispanic community or with a lot of conservatives. So that's how it would be used. It, it didn't change the policy one bit, but what language was working and what right. language was it to describe the policy? Do either of you want to jump in on the immigration question from a polling perspective or what we need to? I mean, it's like, it's, it's unbelievably fascinating what's going on now. And, the, and sometimes you, issues uh, are intuitive and sometimes they're not. Um, let's take gay marriage. You know, the issue became an issue in 2004 when the Massachusetts Supreme Court uh, decided the, in Massachusetts that it would be legal. It was a big issue in the election. Bush ran on a constitutional amendment. Um, it was two to one uh, in favor of the constitutional amendment, overwhelming opposition to gay marriage. Um, but when you track the issue over the course of the election, which we did monthly, and a, a post-election, is the level of support for gay marriage went up. So that the more it was discussed, you know, the more it, you know, support for it went up. And it's been like, you know, just like this steady rise. I mean, I, I don't think it's changed. It's just like this steady, inexorable rise to where you now have an even split and now a majority um, in favor of gay marriage. And I can't even quite understand what drives it because it's clearly independent of the debate. Even when people are against it, the support level goes up. Immigration is different. Immigration has been pretty stable. Um, I poll for the uh, for the LA Times uh, with the Republican pollster um, and University of California and the uh, USC. The and what you see there uh, is that you know it wasn't long ago the Dream Act was unpopular amongst whites and popular with Hispanics, but if you look at our most recent polls, it's been like this pretty dramatic shift in favor of citizenship that's taken place in like the last six months that is you know, somehow accel you know, accelerating. It's not the long-term trend we've seen with gay marriage, mm -hmm. but something's happening on immigration, and it's big in scale, and it's, you know, it's short-term. I would just say that I, I've seen for a long time majority support for comprehensive immigration reform. You've seen a long time extreme support for strengthening <coughs> borders. Uh, but, but politically is a kind of an interesting issue because the center favored it, and uh, the objections were both mostly from the ideological spectrum all the way more on the right and more on the left, and the center 60% favored it. And so I've always looked at that as an interesting issue. I think I wrote a column on this about how it was stuck precisely because even though 60% favored it, it, it had 20% opposite, it had blockers on the other side. And it would only be when those blockers get removed Right or those blockers get dealt with, which is like how many guest workers are you going to have, and how much border security are you going to have, and then how many you know what will be the path of citizenship. That the 60 percent that I think has supported it for a long time, we'll we'll see them see them so see this come through, and I think the political realities have been you know it's really obviously the Latino vote. <clears throat> I don't think until '96 it was even it was measured. I mean I think you know you've seen this thing. I think it was. Maybe uh, it was 2% in 92, and it was like 5% in 96. And you know, you're now you know, close to, if not breaking, uh, double digits in terms of 
uh, you know, registered and active participating with Latino votes. So the, as Stan said, the diversity of the country uh, is real and accelerating. I think President Bush actually, you know, compared to Romney, uh, understood that uh, a lot better in terms of the way he campaigned. And, and Romney seemed to have a co really a complete deaf ear uh, to that in this campaign. As our time, uh, time draws to a close here, we have a couple more questions. Um, I think what, this is a question about robo-polls, but when analyzing polls, do you assign a different weight to automated U.S. live caller polls? Automated live caller is what's slightly throwing me off. I think it means, I think you mean robo-polls, right? Yeah. Yeah. So robo-polls versus live. Yeah, I mean, knowing that in, in the issue, you know, look, we sometimes use them, and a lot depends on, on, on whether it's in an area ha that has cell phone use. Because in the United States, you cannot legally call um, cell phones with automated dialing. So that you automatically exclude all, you know, all cell phone users when you do that. And so you've really got to have them, you know, it may be that only with kind of an older population in Pennsylvania and you know, some district in Pennsylvania that you can do it, but you have to be careful about where you, so you have to be very careful. I mean, you have Nate Silver had, you know, ways of kind of offsetting, you know, uh, statistically, you know, some of the biases, you know, in the polls, but they, you know, but they are part of what went wrong, you know, in the, you know, in the polling in this last cycle. You know, polls that use real, you know, real people, you know, use cell phones, got the diversity right, you know, were pretty accurate. Yeah, I wouldn't actually use, I mean, I wouldn't actually use a robo, a, a robo poll. Now, quite different is an internet poll. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, because, because of my, the question I always have is, well, you know, how long is it going to be? Well, I would say that we, I thought that all polling was going to transfer probably by the next presidential election to the internet. But now what's happened is the way mobile has, has grown up. When I say the internet, the internet is obviously going to include mobile. But the, the, the difference is whether or not it's a live operator, right, who's speaking to someone, not a robo-poll, but whether or not people are, are, are selected, contacted, and fill out the poll either on their mobile device, their tablet, right, or at home. And is that kind of polling really going to replace? Certainly commercially, that kind of polling really, I think, is probably 60 mm, percent, certainly a polling in the U.S., certainly a polling in, in business communities and things like that. And so, you know, phone, phone polling as such, right, is, is, still, is still, I think, the best polling uh, politically. Uh, I did, you know, even uh, the U.K. in 2005, for various reasons, I did half on the phone and half on the Internet. And then I would wait to the phone sample and had the most accurate poll out of that. But uh, but never and saw the differences. But nevertheless, I think you've got to factor in not just cell phones, but whether or not you're going to go to the internet. Barry, the Republican Party is going through a massive effort to rethink its polling after this last election. Some of the polling and pollsters that were quoted back to me uh, for proof of why the polls that were showing Romney a little further behind were robo polls. Uh, what do you, where do you come down on this, the need for a kind of thorough regoing in the Republican well, ranks? So I, two things. On the robo, a, a guy like me, not a pollster, I look at robo calls as, as a persuasion tool or a data collection in terms of building my list, my fundraising, that kind of thing. It's not an accurate reflector of where any public lands on anything. Explain what you mean by persuasion, though. Uh, you know, Press one for a special message from you know, Pat Boone. Or right, so it has you know, nothing whatever. to do with polling at all. No, and, you, know, it's, you know, Congressman so and so, you know, sucks wind or you know, right. groovy or whatever. Right. Um, uh, so that that's kind of how I how I see that. And then the second one was well, just about the overall Republican need to kind yeah, of rethink so, its. So I think that uh, and you know, listening to these guys will be interesting response to this is that one of our, our biggest things, I think, is um, for several cycles what the screen has been. You know, when you get down, when you're actually polling in what most people think of it is, which is the horse race of an election, having an accurate screen of, okay, who am I polling who's actually going to vote? <coughs> and for a long time, I think we've been heavily dependent upon this definition of what a likely voter is. And the demographics 
have changed that an awful lot. And that, I think, where the debate is going to end up on our side and how we change our modeling. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, I think, let me just add that I don't think there's any question. The, a lot of the, the Republican modeling was off. They, they didn't really account. It could be that you didn't account for the full demographic change, but I also think you, you, didn't, you just didn't account for the fact that they had a turnout operation that drove turnout that uh, in, differ, in ways that were different from the pure demographics or that were not usual, just as maybe in the Bush re-election they also were successful in some of the turnout efforts. And so you didn't really pick that up in the polling because you screened that out in the polling by keeping the demographics. There was an, this interesting anomaly because as an electorate we should be getting older. And so well, the anomaly was that actually the Obama re-election drove a younger electorate precisely at a time one would have calculated that we were getting older, yeah. right? Let me last question, uh, Stan, you and Mark can both weigh in on this. It's something I get a lot, a lot, which is wh why this cycle was Nate, did Nate Silver get it so right? Okay, so let's, first of all, note, <laughs> for the record, just as a casual observation, Barack Obama got 3.1 by 3.85. The democracy score last poll was 3.8. Uh, Nate Silver's estimate was 2.6. Uh, and, and, he, and, he, and, he does, and he does rate our polls. He does rate our polls the most accurate of the polls on the um, uh, election. But I that's what I meant, is why did he get it so right about Democracy Corps? <laughs> <laughs> I'll quote you on that. <laughs> you, know, this, you, know, there's, you know, there's three pieces. One is, you know, you know, and I've already answered it. It's, you, know, you just have to understand the country, and it's true of polling, whether you're abroad or, you know, or here. You've got to understand the dynamics of the country the diversity of the country, the culture of the country. You have to understand, you know, the, you know, the presumptions about what an off-year election is going to look like in terms of turnout. You got to, you know, you have to understand what's going to drive that. Um, they made the assumption that 2000, that 2012 would look like 2010, um, and that just, you know, they thought that they, th you know, let's step back. They thought Barack Obama was a fluke. They thought that he uh, was a fluke in getting elected. He created a kind of electorate that was unique to that, you know, election, um, and a lot. And because of their success in 2010, allowed that to color their assumptions about the, you know, the turnout, um, what the electorate would look like. But, you know, in 2006 was an off-year election, is when Democrats took control, you know, of the Congress. 2010 was a very unique year, and if you look at all these trends demographically. You know, they, you know, they trend over time. The shift to the Democrats did not take place in 2008. It took place in 2006. The young voter surge was in 2006. There was no change between 2006 on. The young voter trend took place then. The racial diversity, you know, that's when the country began to, you know, to shift. And the trend has been, you know, steady since. So first, first is just understanding the, uh, the, you know, the country. Second is cell phones and that's, um, uh, the third is turnout models. I know this is boring, but the, it is so hard to reach people to do a poll that our assumption is that when we reach somebody in a presidential year and they say that they are likely to vote, that's our likely voter model. What the pr media were doing is they have, and Pew, is that they have turnout models where they say, well, we have a 60% turnout, and therefore we will, we're assuming that we have a sample that's representative of the country, so we'll take, six, we'll, we'll take the 60% most likely to vote and look at those. I think, they, you know, I think that everybody believes now that that was a deep error, that these models you know, uh, misunderstand how difficult polling is. And when you get somebody on the, on the phone and do a 20-minute survey, um, you were very close to your getting to a voter. <laughs> so then there was a screening that took place. So last, last word, Mark. You know, I, I think, uh, well, luckily I didn't have to do a call in the last election. I think uh, I probably would have had to, uh, I, I would have gone with the direction date silver. It's, the question is, I think it's, it's, it's the Republicans that were off. Uh, the Republicans were off really because their, their voter model, I think had they adjusted it for the actual turnout, particularly in the swing states, and remember, politics changed in a lot of ways. Uh, we were lucky to spend whatever it is was spent on the presidential election. Several billion dollars were focused on swing states, creating a lot of changes both in the whole character of the swing state electorate, really the ability to turn voters out, the scale of the presidential elections. And, and, and so at the end of the day, you know, you take the Ohio polling and you take where the 
Republicans were. I don't believe that they were, they were insincere. They had the wrong model. You know, Obama's model of who they, who they believed they were going to turn out, I think, turned out to be accurate. You know, I remember in 96 that, that you know, if you go back to 96, you think, you think oh, in 96, uh, a lot of the public polls thought uh, Clinton was going to win as, as many as 17 points, right? And in the last night coming back, and there's a good story to end this thing on, uh, last night coming back, uh, they're having, we're having a party, and I've sort of just calculated what I'm going to be a final call. And the president decides, I should just tell everybody what the final call is, right, in front of everybody. Well, that's great, but I've just calculated because Nader is going to get a few more votes, and I've reconciled, because you have to reconcile the state polls with the national polls, that he's, he's not going to get 50, he's going to get 49, right? And I realize I'm going to have to tell him he's going to likely get 49. So I said, well, you're going to get 49, and then I, I forget exactly, but I did hit all three exactly the point. If you go back the next morning, the Air Force One transcript shows that I didn't have even Nate Silver's margin of error. <laughs> uh, the, and I don't think the president, but, but I could see the disappointment on his face that I had not said 50, <laughs> I had said 49. So, okay, <laughs> and gonna, you've paid for this, so you should get the last one, but I just want to, one point about 96. <laughs> you'll be, you'll be charged for these words, yeah, Barry. If you, if but you this, this is win to, an election, you have more polls. This is, to, this is, this is to, to, to Mark's point about what is the poll the president should trust? It's his own. Right. In 96, Mark was able to tell President Clinton, it doesn't matter what everybody else is saying, here's what it is, he was right. In 2004, all the exit polls showing President Kerry was going to be coming in, ours didn't have any of that. No. And in 2012, President Obama's team is the same way. If you talk to them today, they're looking at us like, you can't be serious. You didn't really think you were going to win, did you? <laughs> and so I, I compliment Mark on that because his polls stands. Whoever is the president's pollster is the guy who's ultimately going to be the guy who's right. We hope so. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, thank you, all three of you. That was really great. Thanks so much. Thanks, all of you. Thank you, our wonderful panel, excellent job. I think we're all more insightful about what happens inside the White House. It's a wonderful opportunity to have uh, this chance to hear from those who are actually in the White House talking to the President. Let's also give our moderator, uh, John Dickerson, a round of applause. So thanks again, Mark, for making this possible. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We hope you... Uh, got what you were looking for out of this event. I certainly did, it was excellent. We also have some food, as you saw, I just brought in here. So I would encourage you all to mingle around, and if you didn't get your questions asked, perhaps come and ask one of the panelists afterwards. It's great to have you here, thank you much.